Hello, and welcome to the 2016 Our Town Grant Program How to Apply webinar. This is Jason Schubach, Director of Design Programs here at the National Endowment for the Arts. And I have with me today Jen Hughes, the Our Town Grant Program Manager. So we'll run through the presented presentation today on the application process. It'll be followed by a Q&A session. You can submit questions or comments at any time using the Q&A box. We'll do our best to address as many possible during the time we have uh, following the presentation. Go ahead and put your questions in as they come up during the presentation. We don't need to wait to the end. You guys are all muted and you will only be able to hear us. Please do not use the raise hand button. This webinar will be posted on our website in the home uh, webinar section in the next few days so you can refer to it in the future. So let's just quickly review the agenda for this webinar. We're going to go through a quick definition of creative placemaking. Uh, we'll talk about the grant guidelines, guidelines themselves. Jen will then jump in on how to actually apply and run through the review process. And we'll show you some quick resources. OK, so creative placemaking. What is it? Creative placemaking at the most simple level is when artists and arts organizations and community development practitioners deliberately integrate arts and culture into community revitalization work. This is really about putting the arts at the community development table with other land use, transportation, economic development, and other kinds of organizations and folks who do community development. Really putting that, the arts there is just as important as other, is putting the arts at the table with just, just as important as all the other partners who care about uh, community development. So we're going to jump into the guidelines right, right now real quick. And I want to just talk about, um, you know, point out that there, we're going to be talking about the two different types of project types within our town. We're going to be talking about sort of what were the traditional type of our town grants over the past few years, the arts engagement, cultural planning, and design grants. But then also about our new category we add, added last year and are continuing this year, projects that are about uh, building knowledge within creative placemaking. So we're going to talk about both those two project areas. They are two different kinds of project types within the Our Town um, general grant area. So let's jump Project into talking about arts muted. engagement, cultural planning, and design project projects. Uh, these are projects that really should represent the distinct quality and character of the community uh, that you're working within. These projects really need to ref reflect uh, enhanced vision, a vision for enhancing the livability of the community you're working in. It needs uh, to address the needs of existing residents of the communities and neighborhoods you're working in. These projects need to support artists and designers by integrating them into the fabric of civic and community life. And they need to be creative approaches to addressing community priorities. So these projects need to be about the community that um, they're happening within themselves. And they need to be about what are the priorities of the communities. That, like I said before, this is about bringing the arts to the table to help on existing community priorities. So what is the community you're working with and try to, trying to achieve? And how can the arts or design really help that? Um, so how do we define livability here at the agency? Um, livability to us is about um, improving the quality of life of a place. It's about encouraging creative activity. It's about revitalizing the local economy. And it's about creating a, com a sense of community identity and a sense of place. Um, just real quickly about how you might think about measuring livability. This, this is actually in our guidelines as some examples of, you know, when you have the goal of increasing livability, it might be things like growth in civic engagement locally. It might be new avenues for expressions of creativity. It might be changes in laws or policies. It could be economic development. I think that's the kind of the most obvious thing a lot of people think of, like uh, jobs or revenue growth. Or it could be positive changes in migration patterns. So what are the kinds of projects that you can apply for under our town? Well, um, in arts engagement, there's all kinds of different things you can apply for. And people really do come in for a, a wide variety of different pro kinds of projects. And projects that really do have uh, a mix of different kinds of projects within them. So um, it can be all different kinds of innovative programming that's nice and vague on purpose to make sure that you can come in for projects that make sense for you. Uh, festivals and performances. 
um, public art. Uh, I do want to emphasize, though, that public art in our town needs to work a little bit harder. It can't just piece, be a piece of plop art or just a statue in a plaza. It really needs to be public art that's really about um, doing something more than just being a piece of public art. Um, we are going to talk a lot more about that in our second webinar and give examples of what those kinds of pieces of public art are. Um, so I encourage you to listen to our second webinar uh, coming up in August. Um, uh, it can also be professional and business development for artists under arts engagement. Uh, we also like to fund planning. You know, this is really a lot of the first steps you take within the creative placemaking process. The first thing you, you need to do in a community is understand who's out there, and that's what a creative asset map is, is lets you know who are the creative folks and businesses and organizations that are in your community that you might want to work with. We also do cultural district planning and public art master planning. And design activities, um, we do like to fund design activities too. Design of cultural spaces, design of public spaces, design of artists of workspaces or rehearsal studios, and um, obviously cultural facilities, uh, and uh, community engagement activities in design. These are like design charrettes, workshops, competitions, all that kind of stuff is also fundable in this project type of our town. So what are some of the requirements? Um, in this project type is so for arts engagement cultural planning and design projects we do require that you have two primary partners a nonprofit and a local government and at least one of those partners has to be an arts or design or cultural organization and either partner can serve as the lead applicant so it doesn't have to be the, the city or town or tribe or it can be that has to lead it can also be the arts organization that can be the lead applicant to us but you need both of those partners to apply um, the eligible nonprofit partner must be a 5013C entity. At the time of application, it must be able to demonstrate three plus years of programming prior to the application deadline. So what does that mean? That means that when you apply the arts, if the arts organization, if it's the lead, has to show a three year history of programming. That does not mean it has to have been a nonprofit for three years. It just means it has to show that three years of history of programming. And for local governments, we have a very specific definition of local government. So these are the only things that we consider are local governments. Counties, parishes, cities, towns, villages, or federally recognized tribal governments. For the purposes of these guidelines, those are the local governments that can apply and that, ha that can count as the secondary partner. I know there's a lot of weird water taxing districts out there. They're not weird. They're just water taxing districts or other things that are out there. Um, but we do not consider those local government for the purpose of these guidelines. It has to be one of these um, types of local government. Uh, so um, all also, another eligibility requirement is that applications must include a formal statement of support from the project from the highest ranking local official in the government. So we do require a letter saying, these are the projects that I want to come forward from my local government, from your mayor or tribal leader or county executive. Now, um, some little quirks about that. Uh, if you are a super in you know, if you are applying from the school department or the planning department or the public health department, we're not looking for a letter from the heads of those departments or the superintendent. We're looking for a letter from the mayor or in some cases it's the city manager in some communities or the tribal leader or folks like that. Okay, applications limits. Um, a partnering organization can partner as many and as many applications as they like. So a nonprofit, you know, uh, uh, that wants to work in any community in the country can come in for as many, with as many communi communities as they want to. Um, and uh, the lead applicant can submit up to two applications to our town. So um, each local government can submit up to two applications to our town. Um, that's a change from last year. Last year it was just one. We are allowing two per local government now. A days. Um, applicants can apply uh, for between $25,000 and $200,000, and there's sort of set funding amounts within that. Um, and one-to-one -one match is required from our agency. So that's for all grants at the NEA. That match can be in, in kind. Um, you do have to document in kind, just like you would have to document anything else. So that could be volunteer time. Um, you can match with things like staff time or rental of space. Um, you do not have to match 100% in cash. You also do not have to have the match fully lined up at the time of the actual application. You just have to say where you think the match will come from. 
So one-to-one -one match required and in-kind is okay. So here's the things we don't fund, um, just to go over those real quick. Um, so we do not fund activities that are not tied to long-term civic development goals and strategies. These really should not be one-off projects in a community. They need to be projects that are really tied to the overall, like I said before, what does the community want? want how can, um, what are the community's civic development goals and how are the arts going to help you reach them? That's, that's the kind of projects we're looking to fund. We're also looking um, to fund projects where the, uh, we do not fund projects where the arts are not central to the project, right? We the NEA want to fund arts projects. We don't do general operating support, and uh, this is very important. We do not fund construction of buildings, uh, plazas, any of that stuff, um, purchase or renovation of facilities. We do not fund construction, purchase, or renovation of facilities. The only thing that we will pay for construction of is a piece of public art. We also don't can't do subgranting or regranting, so you can't get a grant from us and then regrant it to someone. Um, uh, Subgranting, uh, the only people exempted from that are local arts agencies, and you guys know who you are. Um, we also can't fund financial awards to the winners of competitions and cannot fund uh, fundraising or financing activities. All right, so that's all, everything about uh, the arts engagement planning and design projects. I'm going to go over quickly some of the guidelines for projects that build knowledge about creative placemaking. So these are projects that are really about trying to get the knowledge of how to do this work out into the world, right? These are about expanding the knowledge base of how to do arts-based community development out into the field. So what's the restrictions on this? These projects are really only available to arts and, arts and design service organizations. These are like membership organizations, um, like the American Institute of Architects or the Theater, um, theater Communications Group or um, American Planning Association or um, Local Initiative Support Corporation. Uh, so they can be either place-based community development uh, organizations or really arts and design organizations. Um, and or it can be, we've opened it this year also to university organizations, some of those university centers that do a lot of this work and kind of training for folks. That's a new thing this year. Who, um, so we are looking for folks that really know how to do that kind of knowledge building out in the field. So these projects should reflect the involvement of an organization's membership. They should reflect a systemic approach to knowledge building and creative placemaking, and they should have a clearly defined system um, for uh, project execution. So what does all that mean? That means that we want to see and know how your system learns, right? Um, I'll just pick on a system. So uh, the, the American Planning Association. So how do the planners learn from the American Planning Association? How would you teach them about arts? Is it webinars? Is it pilot projects? Is it um, you know sessions at a conference? Is it uh, uh, a new website? Is it, so you tell us how your system learns and how you're going to systemically learn, and then um, uh, show us how the money would actually pay to do that. Um, the project should also really have a clearly defined audience. So you know who are your members? Who are the people that you're actually trying to train? And it has to have the appropriate kind of experts in this work on the project itself, too. And we're really looking for excellence within those organizations that are associated with it. So like I said before, it's all, we can fund all different kinds of uh, training initiatives. This is, could be research that's linked back to practice, mentorships, um, training opportunities, technical assistance, stuff like that. Uh, there, there is a required partnership on this project, too. Um, so basically, uh, if you're an arts-based member organization or university institution that's coming in, you must have a place-based knowledge partner, organization, or consultant identified at the time. Now, that doesn't have to be a nonprofit. It could be an individual consultant that you're working with. But, you know, we want to see that you have the right knowledge on, on board to make sure that you actually um, can pull the project off. And vice versa, if you're a place-based membership organization, it's really important that you have an arts-based knowledge partner, organization, or consultant identified, too, at the time um, of the application. So uh, what's just some of the quick eligibility requirements on this? Um, knowledge uh, building applicants must be a nonprofit entity, and we should have put on this slide. It also can be a government entity. Um, if there's like a state university, like I said, knowledge center that wants to come in, um, that's totally cool. And you, again, you must have that three years of programming at the time of your application. You can request up to $100,000 with this, which is, a, which is different from the other kind of project type within our town. Um, and again, we had that one-to-one -one match required. All the, everything that I said before stands. 
so I'm going to pass it over to Jen now, and she is going to talk about how you actually apply. Take it away, Jen. Thanks, Jason. Well, now I'm going to move into the nitty gritties of the application and really navigate you through our website on how to apply, as well as what you can expect when you go to submit your application in our two-stage process. So here I just wanted to orient you on arts.gov on where you can actually scroll through to find the grant guidelines. So here you want to click on grants, apply for a grant. Next, you want to select grants for organizations. And scrolling down towards the bottom, you will see our town as one of those opportunities. So again, Jason went through in a lot of detail about there are two uh, project areas for support, the arts engagement, cultural planning, and design projects, and projects that build knowledge about creative placemaking. When you are actually looking to review the grant guidelines, make sure you're in the correct area, because those grant guideline descriptions and what we require as part of the application are slightly different. So this just points out that element. So a really helpful link to get started and get you oriented is clicking on how to prepare and submit an application. And in terms of what you need to do and be prepared for as it relates to our application timetable, first, we have a deadline um, that you should really pay attention to. This is a precautionary deadline to make sure that you jump through the hoops of getting registered on grants.gov and sam.gov. We recommend that you go through that registration process no later than September 7th of 2015. Because in order to submit your application, you'll need that registration up to date and complete. And the SF-424 form, which we'll get into more details about in a moment, is due through grants.gov on September 21st, 2015. And I really want to stress that deadline. There are no exceptions to that rule, so get your registration squared away as soon as you get off this webinar so you're prepared to submit in September. So the only thing that you need to prepare as an organization for the September 21st deadline is the application for federal domestic assistance. And if you would like to see that, um, it'll take you to grants.gov. Um, we have it on our website under step one. Here's just a screenshot so you know what you're looking for. Um, once you download the PDF, you'll have to complete these various fields. And this is asking for basic information about your organization and an overview of your project. And again, September 21st, that is due. So we stress this because all of this part of the application has to go through grants.gov. This is a mandatory online government-wide electronic application system. The NEA does not have control over the system. Um, it's for all federal grant opportunities. So the steps that you need to take as an organization, if you have not submitted before, or even if you have submitted before, you want to check on your registration. You'll need to first obtain a DEMS number and register with SAM. And SAM stands for System for Award Management. You want to allow at least two weeks for registration or renewal through that system. Keep in mind that in that system, you will have to change your password every 60 days. And again, just want to flag, don't wait immediately before the deadline. Submit your SF-424 no later than 10 days prior to the deadline. And Grants.gov has far more details about that, as well as a help desk that can help you with that registration. So the next step after you complete and successfully submit the SF-424 is our full application due via NEA Go. So what is NEA Go? NEA Go is our grants um, online system where you will submit the substantial part of your application. This system will only be open between October 1st and October 8th. And this is really the bulk of your application, including answers to narrative questions, the bios of the individuals or organizations on the project, um, financial information about your organization, statements of support, programmatic activities list, special items, and work samples. So our advisement is to really review the grant application form materials that will be available on NEA Go well in advance of the application deadline. 
So open up a Word document and draft all of those responses to those questions so that you can easily move them into the grants application form once NEA Go becomes available to you. So again, how to navigate to that on our website. Very clearly, we've delineated step two. And this year, we tried to simplify your experience to guide you through what to expect on the grant application form by providing a complete PDF that you can download, print out, and review about all the questions that we will ask of your organization and your project. So here is just a screenshot of the cover page for that PDF. And what I wanted to point out on this slide is, again, since we have two project areas, just make sure that you've downloaded the correct PDF, either the Arts Engagement, Cultural Planning, and Design projects, or projects that build knowledge about creative placemaking. So as part of that handy dandy new PDF, we have a nice table of contents to, to walk you through each of those elements, which I will quickly peruse through. Um, first is all about the organization. In part one of the application, you're going to have to include information about your organizational budget, as well as your primary partner. Now, as Jason clearly stressed in the eligibility requirements for um, the arts engagement, design, and cultural planning projects, you want to make sure that you have that eligible partnership in place and that is clearly articulated and completed in this piece of your application. So for example, if the local government is applying as the lead, then you want to make sure you have your nonprofit 501c3 listed as your primary partner. So in part 2A, what's new this year um, is that we've introduced a field to provide project background and context. Since these are oftentimes um, multidimensional projects that include a wide range of partners and are really intended to catalyze a long-term impact for the community, we really want to hear from you about why you are doing this project and how you're doing it and how it really fits into the context and needs of your community as it stands today. And the next category about major project activities, this is really the meat and potatoes of your project. Um, we'd advise you not to just give a bulleted list of those project activities, but to really explain how you're going to about, go about doing this project over the year to two year period. Schedule key project dates. You can really succinctly um, demonstrate what's going to happen when. And then you also need to address how your project will be ensured that it will be accessible to all populations of people. So in the project objectives and location information, uh, the objective narrative is where you're really want to going to talk about livability. Under performance measurement, you might be thinking about how you're going to assess the impacts at the end of your project period. What outcomes are you hoping to achieve? Really hearkening back to some of those example of measurable benefits that Jason provided earlier in this presentation. The intended beneficiaries is also a really important piece of this application. Since our town is intended to be a very engaged program that um, involves the community, you should be talking about the intended beneficiaries that you hope to reach. And then under community engagement, talk about how you're going to work with them and how you might have worked with them in the past so that you can really give um, a full picture of your expertise, um, other partners that might be bringing that expertise to the table around engagement. The project budget form, um, you want to make sure you also prepare that correctly and thoughtfully. One of the things that I, I just like to always emphasize here is that all of our projects require a one-to-one -one match. So you will have to show, as part of the project budget, uh, where you anticipate that one-to-one -one match to come from. We do allow organizations to match in kind, so that might include donated materials, donated time, volunteer hours, or other services. But again, um, for example, you'll want to make sure that the income and expenses equal. So if you're requesting 
$50,000 from the NEA as part of your project proposal, make sure that you provide $100,000 in project costs under expenses so that that really captures that one-to-one -one required match. The project participant section of the application is your opportunity to demonstrate artistic excellence. Um, this is the, the place where you'll want to talk about the individuals that are going to be managing aspects of their project, what their roles are on this project, and the expertise that they bring to the project as well. Um, in terms of works of art, since we do fund cultural planning as well as um, in the knowledge building category, a wide range of activities. Think about works of art, not just as that sort of finished piece of public art or finished um, artist live work housing design, but it might also include um, a cultural plan, an asset map, um, and for the knowledge building category in particular, you might also want to include individuals that might be uh, subject matter experts um, or planners or other folks that are working alongside the community. And lastly, you will also need to prepare items to upload. The programmatic activities list is where you demonstrate uh, the last three years of programming that your organization has done. That's really to enable us to vet eligibility and make sure that the organization applying has at least three years of programmatic activities. Statements of support are a critical piece of your application. Letters that are unique, powerful, come from a diverse range of community organizations, community leaders, um, organizational leaders, your partners, are often what help to round out and make a strong application. And if you are applying for arts engagement, cultural planning, or design projects, you will need the highest ranking official of your town, city, tribal government to provide a statement of support. And lastly, work samples. This is your opportunity to provide in a variety of digital formats um, artistically excellent work. So for example, you might want to think about some of the, the artwork that artists might have done in the past to include there some JPEG images of that. You could include audio, video, depending on what's appropriate for the project that you are actually going to be doing. Um, think very carefully about these and select those that are most relevant to the project and best demonstrate artistic excellence. So now that we've walked through the application, I just wanted to make you aware to, to review the related materials on our grant guidelines page on our website. We have a lot of other helpful tools and tips there. And just in hearkening back to the logistics of how to apply via NEA Go, um, we have very specific log into NEA Go instructions on our website. And just want to flag, this is only open October 1st through October 8th. But arts.gov and our grant guidelines will really be um, there to outline every detailed step of this, this application process. Just so you know what to expect when you do log into NEA Go, this is a screenshot. And now that we've moved through a lot of the technical elements of the application, I just want to highlight a few key points and things to think about um, in terms of understanding how your application will be reviewed once it is submitted to us. So first, um, artistic merit is one of our review criteria. And we outline, depending on the project area type, the review criteria on our website. And often, our advice to folks is to print out that page of our website, hold it next to your application, and make sure that you've reviewed to see that you've demonstrated artistic merit throughout your application. What do we mean by artistic merit? That's typically, does the budget make sense? Does it match the project activities? Is the organization really capable to carry out the project? And again, I just want to flag that because that's how you're scored on your application. So half of the score comes from artistic merit, and the other half comes from artistic excellence. So this is really about the quality of the artist, arts, 
design professionals, arts organizations, works of art, or services that a project will involve. So finally, I just want to walk you through to make sure that you are well aware of how our application is reviewed and some other key dates. So we walked through those first three steps. Um, once your application is due through NEAGO, October 8th, it will go under review here on our staff and go through a panel review process. And awardees um, and all applicants will be notified in April of 2016. And the earliest project start date for you to begin your application is August 1st of 2016. That's a really important date because that means any project activities that you talk about in your application should really um, begin on or after August 1st. If you reference other activities you hope to do before the actual grant period, that's fine, but you want to be very clear in articulating that none of those project costs are part of your request from the NEA, nor are they matching costs. We have a lot of great resources that we worked to build out over the past couple years on our website. Um, so I want to draw your attention to that. One is our recent grants section of the website. You're able to search uh, all of our past Our Town awardees. So for example, if you're thinking about a festival, you might want to just search festivals in the Our Town category to get a sense for what were some of those successful projects. I offer this as a source for inspiration as you're forming your project proposal. So last, um, you can follow up and reach out to us at any time at ot at arts.gov for your questions. Before we dive into questions here, I see a lot that have been coming in. I just want to remind folks that next week on our August 5th webinar, we will be talking more about um, what makes a successful application, some tips and tricks, and really diving less into the mechanical aspects of the application and more into how you might think about conceiving a successful project. Great. Thank you so much, Jen. We're going to start getting to questions in just a second. I did want to mention one other resource we have online, which is called Exploring Our Town. And it is case, 70 case studies of um, our town projects that you can look through. And there's also a bunch of insights in there, too, about um, how to actually do this work. So I highly encourage you to take a peek at that. We'll talk more about that um, at our next webinar, too. Um, I'm going to, we're going to go ahead and jump into a lot of the questions here. I know there's a ton here. So we've got about 30 minutes. Um, I'll ask questions, and Jen will jump in. Um, as appropriate. First is, do you need three years of art project programming or just general programming um, to apply? Great question. You just need three years of programming history. So that means your organization has to have been delivering some type of programming over the past three years. So an organization, as we stressed earlier in um, the presentation, doesn't need to be a nonprofit 501c3 for three years but it has to have evidence of programmatic activities, not just forming a board, sort of forming the charter that makes up the 501c3, actually of administering programming, but any programming. OK, is a public university museum without 501 status eligible to serve as the nonprofit organization partner and lead applicant? So it has to be a 501c3. Um, what we've seen are most universities have 501c3 status or are a unit of government as another option as an eligible entity for application. However, if the organization doesn't qualify as that lead applicant or the primary partner, we certainly welcome a wide range of community partners to serve on a project. So that might serve as a tertiary partner on a project. OK. Can an arts organization be part of the local government partner? Absolutely. So oftentimes we see local arts agencies. So it might be the Department of Culture uh, within a mayor's office, or it might be at its own um, independent agency within local government. So that could certainly be uh, fulfilling the requirement for an arts, culture, or design organization and could partner with any 501c3 nonprofit. It doesn't need to have an arts-focused mission. Right, so we do see folks like the local arts agencies uh, working with uh, transportation nonprofit out in the field, or a hospital, or all different kinds of organizations. And the the government, uh, the the local arts agency fulfills the arts requirement for the partnership. 
Okay, does the letter of support need to be a letter or could it be a resolution from the mayor or council in support of the project? So um, we have pretty specific requirements in our application guidelines. Um, we limit all letters of support to a single page. So if you can provide that um, sort of approval by the council for support of that project. I will say letters that really articulate not just a resolution um, of a formal government seal of approval, but more broadly paint the picture as to why this project is important to their city, town, or tribe makes for a really compelling way to express that broader vision as it's seen from the local government. Okay, this, is, this year's application seems to suggest, suggest that our mayor can back two projects, not the one that used to be the limit. Is this a change? That is correct. That is a change this year. Um, a mayor could support two different uh, projects to the Our Town program and only up to two. But I want to emphasize, though, that it would be highly unlikely that we would fund two in the same community. So uh, we wanted to get the opportunity for folks to put more, forward more than one. But we're really looking for people to obviously put the best one forward. It's a small amount of funding. It's a big country. Um, and we also, you know, we'll ask the panelists to, to clearly to clearly see if, if a community can support more than one project locally. So I would be wise in how you use that. Um, but we did want to create that opportunity for folks that um, haven't had that in the past. Here's one I'll answer real quick. Can construction dollars be used as matching? Um, the answer to that is no. So no land purchase, um, no land purchasing, no construction, no renovation costs. That's the same thing. None of that kind of um, capital construction costs um, can be used as match. Uh, so that's a good one to know. Um, can a public university that provides public cultural arts programming qualify as the 501c3 partnering with local government? Sure, that sounds okay to me. Yeah, that's great. Now, so if it is a public university, just to say real quick that um, uh, it, and it's trying to be the, uh, the government partner, um, so like state level universities, those cannot qualify as a local government partner if it's a state level university. But if you're just the public university partnering with local government, that's totally cool. Um, let's see. Okay. Sorry. Can an organization apply that's not specifically an arts organization but has an arts component? So in order to uh, meet the eligibility requirements of the, pri the partnership between the lead applicant and the primary partner, one of those two organizations, their mission must be focused on arts, um, design, or cultural activities. So um, we would probably need a little bit more clarification about what you mean by just a component of it. So you can certainly send along that specific question about the organization you're thinking about to ot at arts.gov. But again, since we are the National Endowment for the Arts, I would highly emphasize that you want to make sure you have really strong arts, cultural organizations, artists, individuals, partners to, to execute your project. Those are the ones that are typically the most competitive in the Art Town pool. OK, this is a large metropolitan area with uh, like different council areas or different boroughs. And they're asking, can the city councilman or like a borough president send the letter instead of uh, the mayor? Um, like who's going to be the person to pick the two projects to put forward? So what's really important here is it's the highest ranking official of that local government. So in this case, if um, there are various boroughs, but there is a mayor for the overall city, then it would have to be the mayor. And the application limit would be two for that particular city. We certainly welcome letters of support and love to see additional partners um, be really excited about a project and express their support. So council members, borough members, additional folks that are within local government are certainly welcome to submit their statements of support. But for a project to be eligible, if there is a mayor, we would expect that the mayor's letter be in there so that it would be an eligible project. Okay, our museum will collaborate with another arts nonprofit on the project. Do we need a letter of support from the city mayor or city manager? Uh, well, I'll jump in on this one. So that's actually not an eligible partnership. Um, you have to have the city on board as one of your actual partners. 
Um, uh, that Now that secondary arts nonprofit is welcome to be a tertiary partner on the project, but you do need to have the city um, mayor or city manager as the actual uh, as the actual um, uh, formal partner eligible, and you will need a letter of support from the mayor. Uh, can a 501c6 qualify? No, we're very specific in our guidelines that it must be a 501c3. Again, that 501c6 is certainly welcome to apply as part of a larger proposal, but they could not be the lead applicant nor the primary partner. Can folks apply through Artworks and Our Town at the same time? Yes, they are certainly welcome to do so. However, they must be applying for distinctly different projects or distinctly different phases in a project. Should an organization register, even if they're unsure if they'll be submitting this cycle? Um, is there any penalty for registering and not submitting? So I would say if you are thinking about it, um, certainly fill out that SF-424 and submit that. There is no penalty if you do not follow through with the NEA go second step of the process. So um, I would say if you, you have it on your minds that you hope to go for it, go ahead and submit the SF-424. All right, so um, with the new allowance to, to submit two applications this year, do I need to submit two forms of S2, SF-424s? So if um, a city or town is applying for two different projects, then absolutely, because they would be two separate applications. And so each application must include both components of the Step 1 SF-424 and Step 2, the NEA GO submission. Okay, can qualified planning activities include the creation of a development plan for fundraising without doing the actual fundraising? So that doesn't sound to me to be one, an eligible activity or something that would be particularly competitive in the Our Town grant program. Um, you might be working on fundraising plan as a sort of complementary sidetrack to your project activities in Our Town, but a fundraising would not be an activity that would be eligible for support. Um, this person's asking a similar question. They're at the stage of a feasibility study, including planning, design, and viability, I guess for a cultural project, a cultural facility. Um, would this be eligible for funding? So again, I just want to emphasize, since we are the National Endowment for the Arts, what would be a compelling phase for support in that type of project, if it is for the design of a cultural facility, for example, or the design of artists live work housing, the community engagement process, the visioning charrettes, um, the architectural urban design, landscape architecture fees, those would all be compelling activities for support from the NEA um, under the Our Town program. This person is asking, our town is on a reservation, are we eligible? Absolutely. Um, okay. In a county government system, is the highest ranking official the chair of the board of supervisors or the county administrative officer? I think that's really uh, up for you guys to tell us. Um, typically, we've seen it be the the chair of the Board of Supervisors is typically the person that comes in, or sometimes it's the county administrator officer. It really is different in different places, and you guys need to uh, help us. You need to let us know what you see as the highest ranking official. All right, all right, we already answered that. Yes, well, we will have this presentation on to review again later after this. Um, all of the questions, this whole session will be posted in just a couple days. Um, the required historic district analysis report and the environmental impact report were a surprise in eight, in eight days prior to the 2014 grant cycle. Many projects will require these. Could you talk about these two important documents? I'm not quite sure what you're referring to there. Um, if you're talking about uh, meeting the requirements of the National Historic Preservation Act and the Environmental Preservation Act, um, that this year we're handling um, in the uh, not in the application phase, but only in uh, with our grantees, and so you don't need to worry about that necessarily. But you do need to begin thinking about it. On our website, there's information about how you become sorry how you stay in compliance with those laws, and I highly recommend that folks give a peek at that stuff. And else I would just like to add, you know, any uh, really strong community planning process will obviously engage the State Historic Preservation Office if that is um, 
of a concern or issue. So certainly be thinking robustly about the partners you bring on as part of your project so that you can really ensure compliance, particularly to those two very important laws. How many worded applications do we anticipate for this grant cycle? So I can speak to that from sort of historically how many grants we've awarded. For example, this past year we've awarded 64 communities out of 250 eligible applications. We do receive more applications um, than those 250 typically, that, but there are many that are not eligible because they didn't necessarily meet the required partnership requirement. All right. We expect to use a public art process, but we don't know who the, so we don't know who who the artists will be. They uh, how do we deal with that with artistic merit under these circumstances? So first off, the the who the artist will be is actually part of your artistic excellence score, and because you're going to be running a process, you should tell us a lot about what that process will be, how that process will guarantee excellence. And then in your work samples, you should show us examples of the kinds of artists, doesn't have to be the actual artists you use, but the kinds of artists that you would like to, the kinds of artists and kinds of artwork that you would like to work with. That will help show to the panel, since you don't know who they're going to be yet, um, the excellent score. OK, if they're currently a partner on, the, on our town grant, can they apply to be a lead applicant for an upcoming grant? Sure, absolutely. And I think the only thing to flag there is to make sure that at, you demonstrate the organization is able to have those two very large projects happening simultaneously. Okay, this person's asking, do musical performances fit into the arts engagement category? The answer to that is yes. Um, that would be definitely, performing arts typically fall into the arts engagement category. Um, this person's asking, uh, where do we find all the questions in the application? Well, you might recall that Jen show to you that whole PDF that you can download. When you go to step two, there's a link to downloading a PDF that outlines all of the questions and, sh and shows you exactly everything you need to fill out, including the number of um, characters you have in each of the spaces. So all that information is in that PDF. I highly recommend you print that out now, or however you or look, at it, look on it on your electronic device and start reviewing that as soon as possible. All right. Uh, is an organization that applied for NEA funding under a different initiative eligible also to apply for our town? I think we answered this already. Yep, absolutely. So long as it's for a distinctly different project or phase of a project, or if you've reworked a project that was previously rejected, um, but you've made some new advancements and have sort of reformatted it uh, and can propose it again. OK. Can a local government partner with a for-profit design agency on the project? Nope. To make the eligible partnership, you need a 501c3 nonprofit with a local government or tribal government. Again, that um, for-profit design firm could certainly serve as a tertiary partner, or uh, fees to support their work might appear in the project budget, but they cannot apply as either the lead applicant or primary partner. Um, if you're already registered on grants.gov and sam.gov, um, do you have to re-register? You do not need to re-register, but I will advise you to go back in, make sure that um, all that information is up to date. Oftentimes in organizations where there might be turnover, the authorizing official might change, so you might need to update that information. You also need to keep um, your passwords up to date, so certainly log in every 60 days and make sure they are up to date. OK. Is there a minimum or maximum amount of letters of support required? So minimum letters of support is one, which means that it has to come for that highest ranking official in um, within the local government or tribal government. And I believe the maximum letters of support, we have uh, specific guidelines in our application materials, is up to 10. Uh, can historic rehab costs be considered an in-kind match? Um, as I said before, no construction costs, no rehabilitation costs can be used either in the match or in the actual grant costs. So no. Um, public, this is a question about public libraries. Uh, if they are, uh, are not necessarily 501c3s, however, they are often um, do a lot of arts work locally, will they still need a 501c3 partner and a local government partner? Yes. <laughs> Um, to what degree does having multiple nonprofit partners or multiple artists or arts professionals impact being awarded funds? 
Well, I, you know, I would say it really depends on the size, scope of your project and your community that you're looking to serve. Um, we've seen a wide range of partners on all different types of projects, and it's really up to you to determine, you know, who are the important parties to bring to the table to make sure your project is successful. So that's the advice that I'll give you there. Um, would ADA compliant renovations to a facility uh, so that the space can be used by community members to create a collaborative public art project to be allowable? No, that's construction costs, no construction costs, no renovations are eligible costs or match. Uh, can a nonprofit in one city partner with a local government in a neighboring town? Absolutely. That is completely acceptable, and, and what you will really want to demonstrate is the expertise that that nonprofit is bringing to the table. And I would imagine the local government is really bringing that expertise around community engagement and knowing the community and now, knowing how to work with them. Can a letter of support come internally from the government organization? For example, can the director of Parks and Recreation write a letter of support? So again, you have that flexibility to include up to 10 letters of support. Um, you still will need that highest ranking official, so if there's a mayor or the county executive, um, the town manager, depending on the form of local government or tribal government leader, um, that also will need to be in there. And I'll just add the caveat that use your letters or statements of support judiciously. Um, make sure that those letters of support are demonstrating various contributions to the project, different elements of the project. Put yourself in the shoes of the review panel. They don't want to re review, you know, fifth, 10 letters of support that all sort of say the same thing. So, you know, think strategically about all elements of your application and what you put forth so that they will really resonate with the reviewers. What about funding equipment for art making? So if you are able to uh, demonstrate that you will actually be utilizing that equipment as part of the arts engagement activities proposed in our town, then that would be eligible, yes. Okay, here's a good one. Um, do local arts organizations need three years of programming history if they are the lead partner? Or is the history of the local government sufficient to cover this? So the, the, if you are the lead partner applying to the NEA, you must have the three years of programming history. If the local government is the lead partner, then no, you do not need that three years of programming history if you're the other nonprofit partner. But if you are the lead partner to the agency, you have to have that three years of programming history. Can you explain more about the August 1st, 2016 start date and what activities would be permitted prior to that time? So no activities that are in your project budget or in your scheduled project activities should really be um, part of your project proposal. Certainly you can paint the context that up until that August 2016 start date you might be doing other preliminary activities that are not covered by the NEA grant proposal. So be really clear about that because um, Oftentimes we see folks that were, might have a great project, but we're not able to support because all their project activities are taking place before the earliest project start date. So we really emphasize August 2016 um, for you to, to begin demonstrating what you are requesting support from the NEA. And that must also be for all matching costs. Matching costs um, must be expended and support project activities that are taking place on or after August 1st. Here's a knowledge building question. Um, can you describe the concept between, behind quote unquote placed based entities? So that, what we mean by that are um, place based organizations that are about working on community development or affecting place. So organizations like the American Planning Association, Local Initiative Support Corporation, Enterprise Community Partners, um, all of these kinds of organizations have been around for a long time and working on and have lots of members and have been working on making uh, making places better in the country. So that's that's what we mean by that. Okay, you mentioned no subgranting. If an artist is hired to work on a project, do they need to be identified in the proposal with budget and subcontracted versus quote unquote given a grant? Yes, so we, since we cannot do subgranting with the exception of being a local arts agency where we can allow that, um, you know, one of your line items in your project proposal might be for sort of the artist commission. So it might include compensation for the artist uh, to work on their commission. It might include materials as well as it relates to the artist. Um, so certainly you can include that in your 
uh, application and part of your project budget. What we mean by subgranting is you can't run a competitive, um, a, a contractual subgrant process to an individual, for example. But they can be um, have their services paid for as part of the grant. Yes, we're the NEA. We like to pay artists <laughs> or designers for their work as part of our um, projects. Uh, so, uh, can an architect contribute matching funds towards, a, towards the production of a plan or model even though there is a physical breaking of ground or building, or does that constitute construction? Um, if it's just the design of the, the plan or the model, we could consider that design fees, and that could absolutely be um, part of a match. Um, if it's anything related to you know, everything up to the breaking of the ground uh, is our eligible costs. Um, Let's see, we've already talked about average number of applications. We have a federal agency involved in our project in addition to the city and the 513C partnership. Where would they fit best in the application? So that's where you would include them under the list of key project partners. Uh, so you can certainly list that agency and describe their role, whether it's in advisement um, or some other capacity that they're supporting a project. And one thing I will flag, because it was a federal agency was brought up, is that that one-to-one -one match requirement that the NEA requires must be from a non-federal source. So for example, um, a community cannot use their community development block grants to match the NEA funding, because uh, CDBG funding comes from a federal source. Do you have to include a letter of support from the partner? Yes, I would say that it's very wise to have a letter of support so it shows their authentic enthusiasm, um, sort of articulates the role that they're going to play on the project. Um, do you have to have, if it's a tribal government and there's not a lot of 501c3s within the tribal area, do you have to have the 501c3 and the tribal government? Yes, that is a requirement of the grant. Um, you know, if there are certain projects that tribal governments are, are looking to do, we've funded a lot of great partnership projects for Native communities in the past. So send us an email to ot at arts.gov, and we can certainly make some of those introductions for you um, to, to identify some potential partners. All right, we run, a, we run a yearly arts festival and are expanding to host a dance showcase. Can the funds be used to provide transportation for international teams to get to the event? So I would say that doesn't sound like a really compelling Our Town project because it's really about enlivening um, the community and making sure that there's an engagement process for the existing residents. That to me sounds more like a straight Artworks grant as it's described. And Artworks is another funding category we have here at the agency. Um, again, for something like that, uh, and we have funded a, a number of festivals in our town. It needs to be tied to, again, why is this a community priority? What difference is this festival going to make in the community? And, you know, why is it's not doing something for or to the community. It's doing something with the community, I think, is the difference there. Okay, we have time for a couple more questions. Um, if the town is the lead partner and has three years of programming experience, can the nonprofit partner be a newly formed 501c3 Public Arts Commission? Sure, as long as that Public Arts Commission, that is the nonprofit 501c3, is not serving as the lead applicant on the grant. And folks, I just got the warning, that was our last question that we were able to cover today. And we want to thank you for listening in. We want to encourage you, if you have additional questions that weren't addressed, to email us at ot at arts.gov. And finally, I just want to put a reminder and a pitch for our webinar next week at this time, 3 p.m. Eastern time, um, on August 5th, where we'll really be speaking a little bit more towards the tips, tricks, and inspiration for a successful project proposal. Thank you again for your attention and participation. Thanks so much, folks. Have a great day.